Vedantic Cosmology and Evolution From time immemorial, the subject of cosmology draws our attention to a great extent. Our ancestors tried to study the subject in their own way and arrived at some interesting conclusions which will be of great interest even now. Upanishads, just like science, always encouraged questioning and Vedanta maintained strict logical systems. It was Swami Vivekananda who tried to reconcile science and Vedanta for the first time in world history more than a hundred years ago. In this brief presentation, we shall compare meaning of cosmology and evolution as per science and Vedanta. Our universe was born about 15,000 million years ago. A pinpoint of super dense and intensely hot matter erupted in a fierce burst of energy creating space and time as it expanded. Galaxies form at, a, at about 1000 million years after the Big Bang. With the help of COB probe, the scientists finally proved the occurrence of Big Bang. EM rays from the edge of the universe gave this mighty incredible sketch of a cosmic soup in the first few seconds. So the theory of Big Bang says first came the space-time bubble then gravitational forces and then quarks, anti-quarks followed by proton, neutron, hydrogen, helium, formation of nebulas, stars, solar systems and planets etc. 13 billion years have elapsed since then. From Big Bang came manifested energy, energy condensed into matter from matter, life evolved and life resulted in complex life systems. Who made the correct choice? At every stage, there were millions of choices and it was as if someone has chosen the correct answer. The problem arises at every step when we try to solve the riddle of cosmology. Stephen Hawking believes that he will one day find the final answer of the riddle. He names it the theory of everything. Even then, when he looks at the harmony and coherency of evolution, he also wonders if hundreds of people scream together, can it become a Beethoven melody? This theory can be the one answer from scientists for this coherency, that is the self-organizing universe theory. The earth even the entire universe on the whole acts as a gigantic single cell. There is perfect coordination in the entire system though it has got billions of species through innumerable such feedbacks. Our Upanishads say Yatra Vishwam Bhavati Eka Needam where the universe becomes like one unit or one abode. This is the goal of the self-organizing universe. Here there is perfect coordination as in the human body though it has got billions of different cells. Swamiji used this corollary to explain the perfect harmony described by the Upanishads as mentioned above. Today these scientists are drawing corollary between earth and the human body. The theory of evolution. Let us consider now how this evolution is described in biological sciences and Vedanta. Darwin's theory follows the rule of natural selection with survival of the fittest as its motto. Swami Vivekananda quotes Patanjali and explains the meaning of the change of species is due to the infilling of nature. Spontaneous manifestation. Just as the farmer enables water to flow into the field only by removing the obstacles, so does nature manifest spontaneously when the obstacles are removed. Jatyantara Parinama Prakritya Purat Consider a little seed. It can become a gigantic tree in time. Seed is the involved form of this gigantic tree. Tree is the evolved form. Swamji tells us that we are involved form of a Christ or a Buddha. Buddha or Christ is our evolved form. All knowledge skill, talents 
are already in every man, only they are awaiting manifestation. Evolution as per Vedanta. Vedanta holds that the evolution is something innate in every being from the amoeba to the human being. As if a compressed spring is kept in each one of us which tries to expand continuously. Recalling Big Bang, we must remember that about 600 million years ago complex life systems started. Simple bacteria, algae ended with self-reflecting organisms. Then human beings evolved, the nervous system ended in a complex brain structure. It seems as if the scheme of evolution is to evolve the complete human being. As evolution progresses, we notice increasing complexity, increasing diversity, but at the same time we notice also increasing organization and increasing connectivity. Human beings are different from other, other species and other animals by the fact that they have the special ability to think, to know, to perceive and to develop their consciousness. When human beings evolve for the first time, consciousness is reflecting on itself consciously. The goal according to Vedanta, the final goal of evolution is this, the freedom of the soul. Swami Vivekananda on Darwin's theory. Swamiji says, in the animal kingdom, we really see such laws as struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, etc. evidently at work. Therefore, Darwin's theory seems true to a certain extent. But in the human kingdom, where there is the manifestation of rationality, we find just the reverse of these laws. For instance, in those whom we consider really great men or ideal characters, we scarcely observe any external struggle. In the animal kingdom, instinct prevails, but the more a man advances, the more he manifests rationality. For this reason, progress in the rational human kingdom cannot be achieved like that in the animal kingdom by the destruction of others. The highest evolution of man is affected through sacrifice alone. A man is great among his fellows in proportion as he can sacrifice for the sake of others while in the lower strata of the animal kingdom, that animal is the strongest which can kill the greatest number of animals. Hence the struggle of the fittest is not equally ac applicable to both kingdoms. Man's struggle is primarily in the mental sphere. A man is greater in proportional as, proportion as he can control his mind. When the mind's activities are perfectly at rest, the Atman manifests itself. The struggle which we observe in the animal kingdom for the pre preservation of the gross body has its use in the human plane of existence for gaining mastery over the mind or for attaining the state of balance. Like a living tree and its reflection in the water of a tank, we find opposite kinds of struggle in the animal and human kingdoms. Swamiji inspired Jamshedji Tata. Jamshedji Tata is well known as a pioneer in Indian industry for the establishment of steel. More than a century ago, it was Swami Vivekananda who inspired him for the first time to establish centers for higher education and research, especially in the fundamental sciences. What is striking is that Jamshedji Tata offered the first directorship of such an institute to Swami Vivekananda. In response, Swamiji sent Sister Nivedita to assist in that noble work and the Indian Institute of Science was formed in 1909. The Indian Institute of Science, born out of the vision of great minds, is the foremost scientific research institution providing postgraduate education. This institution, as envisaged by Swami Vivekananda, has one of the best material science labs providing the best of research results for the development and production of material for various R&D labs and industries. Also, it is a world-class institution in areas of physics, aerospace technology, knowledge products, bioscience and bio biotechnology. 
This is the one institution where convergence of technology like biotechnology, information technology and nanotechnology is emerging. The results will have tremendous influence in improving solar cell efficiency and healthcare, particularly drug delivery system. While earlier IISC was focused on pure research, it has increasingly been opening its doors to interaction with industry. Nearly a score of international and Indian companies have set up research laboratories at the IISC and over a hundred projects have been taken up by scientists there. For the IISC, the centenary year marks the opening of a new chapter as it gears to meet the challenges of the future. Swamiji and Jagdish Chandra Bose Sir Jagdish Chandra Bose was a famous scientist and biologist. Even when India was under the shackles of foreign rule and Indians scorned, scorned by the British, he bravely faced innumerable difficulties and carried on his experiments successfully with the help of self-made instruments. He is considered one of the fathers of radio science and is also the father of Bengali science fiction. He has the first, he was the first from the Indian subcontinent to get a US patent in 1904. It was Jadish Chandra Bose who explained that plants also have life and suffer pain like us. He was the inventor of wireless telecommunications. When Swami Vivekananda was in Paris in 1900 for the Paris Exposition, Jagdish Chandra Bose was also present there as a speaker in connection with the Congress of Scientists and Swamiji met him frequently. Often the Swami would point out to his acquaintances the greatness of this Indian scientist whom he described as the pride and glory of Bengal. The University of London offered Bose a BSc degree. Probably he was the first scientist to create a mechanical model of the memory of human brain. He established the Basu Vigyan Mandir to enable Indians to undertake research in science. Sister Niveta and another disciple, Mrs. Sara Ole Bull, helped him in various ways. Acharya Bose was also highly regarded within the devotee circle of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda group because of his associations with, the Swa with Swamiji and Sister Niveta. In memory of Sister Niveta, Acharya Jagdish erected a striking base bas relief in bronze, a figure of a lady with the lamp at the entrance of the Bose Institute. Vivekananda and Nikola Tesla Swami Vivekananda was much interested in science. He had many friends among scientists and they used to discuss the common grounds between religion and science. At that time, science and religion were more or less antagonistic. But Swamiji placed religion on reason and logic and turned the interest of scientists towards Vedanta and its principles. One such leading scientist was Nikola Tesla a great scientist who specialized in the field of electricity. As early as 1891, Tesla described the universe as a kinetic system filled with energy which could be harnessed at any location. His concepts during the following years were greatly influenced by the teachings of Swamiji. After meeting Swamiji and after continued study of the Eastern view of the mechanisms driving the material world, Tesla began using Sanskrit words like Akash, Pran and the concepts of Illuminiferous Ether to describe the source, existence and construction of matter. Late in the year 1895, Swamiji wrote in a letter, Mr. Tesla thinks he can demonstrate mathematically that force and matter are reducible to potential energy. I am to go and see him next week to get this new mathematical demonstration. In that case, the Vedantic cosmology will be placed on the surest of foundations. I am working a good deal now upon the cosmology of the Vedanta. I clearly see their perfect union with modern science and the elucidation of the one will be followed by that of the other. Tesla was much impressed to hear that the Swami and his explanations of the Sankhya cosmogony 
and the theories of cycles given by the Hindus were so rational. He was particularly struck by the resemblance between the Sankhya theory of matter and energy and that of modern physics. Tesla could not succeed then in his effort to show the identity of mass and energy, but the solution did come 10 years later in a paper by Albert Einstein. Swamiji had by then passed away. Swamiji planned to write a book in the form of questions and answers on comparing science and religion. Enthusiastically, he wrote a detailed letter to a disciple with a diagram explaining the relation between cosmology and Vedanta. He planned the f first chapter of cosmology which would show the harmony between Vedantic theories and modern science. Swami Vivekananda on Science and Vedanta Of all the scriptures in the world, Swamiji says, Vedanta is the one scripture the teaching of which is in entire harmony with the results that have been attained by the modern scientific investigations of external nature. It seems clear that the conclusions of modern materialistic science can be accepted, acceptable harmoniously with this religion only to the Vedantins. It seems to us and to all who care to know that the conclusions of modern science are the very conclusions the Vedanta reached ages ago. Only in modern science they are written in the, in the language of matter. This then is another claim of the Vedanta upon modern western minds, its rationality, the wonderful rationalism of the Vedanta. I have myself been told by some of the best western scientific minds of the day how wonderfully rational the conclusions of the Vedanta are.